Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. We uh, will start in just a minute. Um, Olivia is going to help us with the call to worship, and then we'll have the prayer of invocation. tell the story of unseen things above. Of Jesus and his glory. Of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it's true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story to be my theme and glory. To tell the old story of Jesus and his love. Let us join in our prayer of invocation. Jesus, you who walked among us and lived so radically that in the end even your friends betrayed you, give us courage, gift us with breath that fills our bellies and soothes the panic fluttering of our hearts. Jesus, you who as we weep, who ate and drank, who prayed loudly and alone, who spent a lifetime filled with doubt, but didn't allow that to stop you from speaking up and acting out. Grant us strength. Move not only our mouths to prayers of justice, but our bodies to action. Jesus, you who brought sight and life, who calmed storms and fed the masses, you who welcomed all who were excluded, give us rest. Guide us to those who will share the load so that when the pain becomes too much to bear, we may lay down, knowing the good work will go on. Amen. And our first hymn, courtesy of College Street Congregational Church, is Just As I Am.
May Christ's passion for what is right fill your heart and flow out through our hands. May we serve others with a joyful spirit and accept their gifts wholeheartedly in return. Let us remember we are never alone. God's grace will bind us and our prayers revive us. The peace of Christ be with you. Spirit of Christ, we come to you with our hands outstretched, hearts heavy with dread. We hold up to you the grief in our hearts, the personal failings, the endemic injustices, the catastrophic disasters, and the weight of it all brings us to our knees. We need to be reminded that you see us through a lens of love and compassion. With every breath, we invite you in your forgiveness and encouragement. We stumble and you catch us. We learn, yearn and you listen. We hunger and you fill us up. Amen. Our first reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not, only, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, although not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he had put on his robe and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, Servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I'll pick up with the other reading in a few minutes. It's nice to actually be here for the service this year, seeing as Holy Week last year, I was uh, stuck at home with COVID, and my wife was in Pennsylvania caring for AJ after an appendectomy. So I'm enjoying a really boring Holy Week this year. Um, but our stories, our texts of Holy Week, the things that the church talks about during this week are full of many things we could talk about. As happens sometimes, it's a question of what to focus, what, what to focus on, what to choose to talk about. These stories, in a way, are kind of like many people's lives. A lot of people have a lot of things going on, lots of things to distract them, lots of people clamoring to be heard in their lives and in the media. And the question is, who do we listen to? Who do we imitate? On Sunday, we talked about Jesus' humility. The example he set coming into Jerusalem, not as, as a king, not with an ostentatious display of wealth, or as a military general trying to scare everybody by his power, but as a humble teacher. And yet the people were excited for him to come. In this reading from John, Jesus demonstrates a new lesson, showing us that we should not just use our words, but our actions in how we treat others, demonstrating service to each other, he could have easily reminded them of his status. As a teacher, he was due respect and could have made them wash his feet. But instead, he washed theirs. He knelt and washed the feet of his disciples as a reminder to them and to us that there is no place to, 
there's no call to place any person above another. We must each spend time being tended, washed clean, and shown unwavering love in our precious bodies. We are also to care, called to care for one another, to be humble, to listen enthusiastically, to show up for the most vulnerable people in our lives and our communities. Every day we must be ready to give and to receive. We must stay alert, for Jesus moves among us, and we will find him where we least want to look. We cannot stop at speaking the words that Jesus taught us. We must be bringers of justice and mercy. We must embrace discomfort if it brings us in line with Christ's message of radical love and acceptance. Jesus did all of this and more. He wept and despaired. He felt the agony of a human body and the pain of betrayal by those he loved. He was beaten and rejected and left to die. Questions on his lips, even at the very end. And yet, he washed feet. He continued to show up, even knowing what he did about how flawed people could be. His human heart must have been breaking, and yet he stayed to teach and to be in community with his disciples. Spirit of Christ, we pause to extend to you what feels most vulnerable in each of us. We ask you to pour out compassion over us as you poured water over the feet of your disciples. We may be prideful, uncomfortable, anxious, depressed. We may be grieving or overwhelmed, but we ask for your help attuning ourselves with your guidance, strength, and hope. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to one another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. For Jewish people, then and now, the Passover celebration reminded them of how God rescued their ancestors from slavery in Egypt, provided for them over and over in their journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. But it's not just their ancestors. Jewish people today, when they observe the Passover, one of the prayers says, we were slaves in Egypt and God rescued us. Now, literally speaking, of course, they weren't in Egypt, modern, modern people saying this, but they are owning the story. It's not just long ago, it applies to them as well. <clears throat> this always reminds me of the way that we say in the communion service, this is Christ's body broken for you. Not Christ's body broken for the disciples long ago, but Christ's body broken for each of us here and now. We share in that story, but we also remember Jesus' use of the Last Supper, presenting his own sacrifice as having an effect for us. That Last Supper was an intimate moment of sharing with his disciples, 
But of course, a lot came next. They left. He went to pray in the garden. The disciples all fell asleep because they were tired. In the garden, he struggled, knowing what God had planned for him, but not sure he could go through with it. Then being betrayed by Judas, arrested, and ultimately crucified and buried. While Jesus' story here is unique, the emotions that he and his disciples experience are common for many people. Moments of intense connection can often be followed by struggles and fears and challenges we don't think we can face. We too sometimes experience having people that we thought we could trust fail us and betray us. And of course, in that story, it's not just Judas betraying Jesus, but also Peter and the others who run away and pretend they don't know him. Now, we could say a lot about Judas. I have friends who've written entire books. The Gospels present him as the bad guy. But in an odd sense, since Christians say that Jesus was fated to die, Judas was in that sense, just playing the part, making the story happen. It wouldn't have happened, or at least happened that way, without him. But maybe there's another way to look at it. The disciples all frequently misunderstood Jesus, tried to fit him into their expectations, their understandings. And Judas did the same. It seems he... And some of the others may have wanted Jesus to start a revolution. They missed the point when Jesus kept talking about his kingdom. Some people in that time were maybe hoping that Jesus' arrest would be the spark that would set off the revolution and the Jewish people would rise up and throw out the Romans just as their ancestors had thrown out the Greeks. But of course that's not what happened. But that also brings us to the question of the crucifixion. Christians have often made theological points about it, but they've often overlooked the fact that it was the Romans killing Jesus and not the Jews. Jesus was arrested and crucified not because of his theological disagreements with the Jewish community, but probably because the Romans saw him as a troublemaker, as someone who if he really was claiming to be king, could be a threat to Rome. Christians have often focused on the sacrificial elements of the crucifixion, arguing that God somehow needed Jesus to pay for human sin. But some people have also questioned that because does that mean that God wanted Jesus, his own son, to suffer and die, all because of God's love? It seems like a puzzling contradiction. Some preachers, though, have turned that around, focused instead on the suffering of Jesus, and saying that when we suffer, our experience of suffering can help us connect to Jesus, even promising that if we suffer in this life, it's preparing us for something better in the next life. I understand that that gives some people hope but I think sometimes people have twisted this around, encouraging people to accept their suffering and even injustice and oppression, rather than arguing that God wants us all to be free and wants us all to live the lives that Jesus spoke about when he said that he was bringing his kingdom here and now. A theologian that I respect, his name is Miguel de la Torre, pushes this in a different direction, though. He says that the cross is not so much a symbol of our salvation, but a symbol of death and repression by the Romans, and sometimes later used by, by Christian nations later on in the ways they oppressed other peoples. He said that Jesus offered freedom and redemption in his teachings and example. But he goes on to suggest that in going to the cross, Jesus was showing solidarity with people in their suffering, not saying that suffering was good, but showing that God 
understands and sides with them. He says that rather than romanticize the disenfranchised by claiming that they freely suffer and freely serve, Jesus shared their suffering and their plight so that they might have someone who truly understands their pain and so that God can learn what it means to be human in an unjust world. He concludes that to pick up our crosses and follow Jesus is an invitation not, not to suffer, but to stand in solidarity with the oppressed of the world, a solidarity which might cost us everything. There are no easy answers here, but these give us important things to think about as we continue through Holy Week. We gather to remember the Passover meal. This night was a tradition, a time of holiness for the Jewish people, a yearly rededication for and of liberation. God, help us remember the pain and betrayal on a holy night. Let us walk with Christ and his disciples, taste this precious meal, and reflect on our place in the story. We are each of us. Judas, scorned and threatened, turned away from the table, and yet he remained, just as we are asked to remain. We cannot bring peace without liberation, nor forgiveness without grace. We cannot taste this bread or cup without remembering the bitterness of choices we've made. We cannot share it together without being reminded that we have a place here, and it is as a cherished member of the family. We are loved no matter what. This bread and cup remind, bind us together. May it fill us with the Spirit of Christ and empower us to break the chains that keep us all from being free. Amen. Let us join in the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is said, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. This is why I should have prepared it ahead of time. There we go. Jesus said, This is my body, broken for you. Jesus said, This is my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. Crown your ancient church's story. Bring its bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. Amen. 
Our closing hymn is Were You There? We leave this time together surrounded by the figures in this story. Christ and his disciples walk with us as the shadows of what we have done and what we can yet choose to do. This story is not finished. Tonight we must lay down and weep, but soon, soon we will be lifted up again. Amen.